to Give It A Nudge this week. Great episode. We've got a friend of mine on the show. I always love having friends on, as you know. Today we have someone who many of you may know, but may not know what he's doing. Merrick Watts, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Gracie. Thank you very much. So, let's start by, before we go into your history, which some people know a little bit of and some people don't, mm -hmm. let's talk about what you're doing right now. Just a quick overview of your current main business, because I know you're doing a yep. lot. Yeah, I do lots of different things. Uh, I still work in media and I still do uh, lots of different projects across lots of different disciplines. Uh, but my business is uh, Grapes of Mirth. And uh, Grapes of Mirth is a, uh, an events company um, based primarily uh, amongst the wine industry. So we do large-scale comedy events in yep. wineries and wine regions all around the country. And ancillary to that, we do other stuff as well, uh, including DTC and we also do... What's DTC? Uh, Direct to customer sales, okay. so we um, we we flog we flog wine. Yeah, um, that's, that's much better that's, than DTC. That's very DTC is terrible. Sounds like a wanker. DTC. Yeah, say that again. I only said it because I thought that you'd be impressed <laughs> if I knew that. Um, <laughs> We sell, we sell wine. We sell wine. We sell wine. DTC? Yeah. Direct to customer? Direct to customer. Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah, so there you go. We don't have a shop. We have no shop. There's no, no shop. No. Um, well, you're an events company. You would be mad yeah. to have a shop, right? Yeah, exactly. So we do, we do that and we also, as part of that, we also produce um, a, a live show called An Idiot's Guide to Wine, which I've been touring for about 18 months, a bit longer. Than that, I need the, to come to that. It's the longest touring show I've done in my entire career. I thought you were going to say it's the longest show ever in the history of time. No, no, it's not, it's not so that long. It's about <laughs> 70 minutes and it's great. You'd love it. You would love it. It's very funny. So I've had, you, I've had an event with you. Yep. The event when you came and you did the, the wine tasting for, yes. what was it, 12, 20 of us? Yep. Something like that. Yep. That was awesome. So truth be told, in all seriousness, I was actually secretly trialling little elements of an idiot's guide to wine on you guys because I was like, I'll just test and adjust, test and adjust. And here's like, 20 idiots. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> Perfect. I, went, I mean, here they go. I mean, I was going to be the idiot, but these guys are going to do it for me. Uh, but it was, it was wonderful because I was able to, you know, in a really kind of friendly environment uh, with people who engage with wine, do some jokes, have some fun, and just sort of see where people's brains are at. Because the, the show itself, An Idiot's Guide to Wine, um, is a, a very strange combination of wine knowledge and certif certified wine knowledge that yep. I've got. Uh, but it's comedy. It's a really, really nice um, and did they drink during that show? Absolutely, they yeah. drink during the show. Because we drank. I feel <laughs> we, got, we definitely got more engaged Absolutely. as the night went on. Correct. <laughs> Which is why people have liked the show, because I think that if they don't like the comedy, they certainly like the wine. So Yeah, um, and everyone's funny when you're drunk. That's right. right. It's perfect. Yeah, that's I, right. I get it. It makes a lot of sense. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's all part of the same business. All right. Well, before we come back to that, because we will, and I'll come back how you ended up that and how you've ended up with your qualification, which you've told me, which blew my mind. Um, and we'll come back to the name as well, because you were about to tell me where it came from and I stopped you. But let's just go sort of back, back, back into your, to your life. You mm -hmm. obviously are well known for being on, on radio. Mm -hmm. I think people would be interested to know, what, one, how you fell into that. And then when you came out of that, what did you do? Because everyone knows what you did during mm -hmm. it, because we all heard it. So yep. sort of before and after. Uh, so I was doing stand-up comedy with Rosso in Melbourne. I and didn't know that. Yeah, we were doing stand I started as a stand-up comedian when I was 20. Yeah. So I was quite young. And um, pretty much straight out of high school because I had to repeat year 11 because I'm so good at school. So they say you were a joke and you thought, got it, I know I'll, what I'm I'll do, do that. They said, you're an idiot. You're, <laughs> and I went, I know that too. Um, so uh, I was started as a stand-up comedian. I started working with Rosso when I was in my early 20s. We were putting on shows for the Melbourne International Comedy Festival and we were invited on Triple J. Uh, to talk about our comedy festival show, which yep. is quite a common thing. Uh, we impressed them. They asked us to come back again the next week, and we went back again. They went, you guys are really funny. You should go and talk to the Drive show. So we did a couple of appearances. That turned into regular appearances. That turned into trialling on Sundays. This is all in the course of, of about just over a year mm -hmm. uh, before we were doing Drive. We got picked up to do Drive cool. on, on Triple J, and I think to this to this day it's still the, the highest rating show on that, on that shift that right? for, for Triple J. And how long were you guys I mean, it seemed like a long time. Two years. Two years full-time on Triple J. That's all it was. And then, it was. then we left, departed to Nova to start Nova. Yeah. So we're the first two people to speak on air at Nova. We started the, the brand. I didn't um, know that either. Yeah. We, we were literally at the, the foundation. Um, of, of Nova, which was very exciting. I mean, oh, yeah. starting a media company Massive. and being the face of it was awesome. And then uh, I was, went to Nova and then I was uh, at other radio stations. I've worked at almost every single radio station. All com I've worked for every company, um, <laughs> but I've worked at most stations around, and I've enjoyed all of them. And then about five years ago, on 20 years of, of continuous radio, yep. I 
wanted to step out of the bubble. I was at the end of uh, coming to the end of a three-year contract. I was at two years into a three-year contract, yeah. and I had this idea for Grapes of Mirth. I was in yeah. a winery. I thought comedy in a winery would be amazing. I would love to do it. Trialed it, and um, and that, that was it. I handed in my papers quite early in the year and said this will be my last cool. year. Had a beautiful exit from radio. Great relationships intact, and uh, and now I combine my two loves. Nicely handled. Thanks very much, Steve. I think we're done. So, <laughs> so before you go, <laughs> the mirth, grapes yep. of mirth. You were about just before we started filming. You were about to tell yep. me. I said, "Don't tell me," because I want to hear it while we're filming. Uh, where, where did it come from? It comes from a. It's a literary reference or a nod to a literary reference from the Steinbeck novel um, *Grapes of Wrath*, which is the story of Tom Joad. And if if you've ever read it, it is horrifically I've depressing. Never read it. It's awful. Oh, so don't. It's a wonderful read. Like it's a beautifully written book. It's an amazing, but it's very very sad. It's How is it on audio? Uh, it'd be long. It'd be a long book, but I, I was, I'd read it. I'd read it as a young man, and then I, I began reading it again about six years ago for whatever reason. And I was like halfway through, and I went, "Oh my god, why? This is so depressing. It's such a sad story." And then it just kind of stuck with me: grapes of wrath, grapes of wrath. And then when I was in the winery, it just the word mirth just popped in my mind. It, it's the direct opposite. It's the total opposite of of it. So I just sort of went, "This will be grapes of mirth," which is really a in hindsight, a pretty stupid name for a company. But stupid names work. I mean, look at them all. Yeah, that's true. Just think of I mean, a good Google. name. Think Google. of a, exactly. What's think that? Of a, you think of a sensible name that's been successful. There's none. There's not one. You give me one successful company that has a sensible name. Concord. Ooh, scratch that. that um, yeah, they're not successful right no, now. No, not anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good point. You know, one of, our, one of our staff talking on Concord, we were talking about getting our guy from London to come over for an event that we had. And some one of the guys in Australia said, "Oh, we'll bring you over on Concord." He said, "What's Concord?" Yeah. So he's, yeah. He's a I don't know how many people who watch this show will actually know what Concord is. Yeah, or was. Go and look it up. Mm. Um, all right. So now let's go into the really interesting part, which I remember when you first told me blew my mind. The qualifications that you have mm. in wine, which are quite extraordinary, which I didn't even realise existed. Talk to me a little bit about one. What, because they're not easy to get. One, what no. made you have the, the sort of discipline to do it and, and why you did it? Uh, so I hold uh, what is called a Westset Level 3 uh, with merit, which is uh, one below diploma in wine. It's an international wine standard recognised everywhere around the world. Um, you sit exams. They're very, very difficult. At yeah. Level 3, they're actually very, very difficult. It's a combination of multiple choice questions, uh, blind wine tasting and uh, essay writing. Um, and it is very difficult to get. Tell me about the blind tastings, because I think you told me about this before, and I was like, that just sounds mental. At level three, you do uh, one white and one red, yep. and then you have to write a description of that wine, and the what you, not necessarily what that wine is, but yep. the characteristics of that wine. And uh, the, the person who's examining you at the time, who's in charge, for me it was an MW, a master of wine, very, very high. Um, they were they also to taste the wines and they write their own notes and they're all kind of batched together and then I believe the process is they send them all the way to the UK and they kind of cross reference the two the and if yours are in line yeah yeah I know they don't they, they, they've know. got no wine knowledge there I know all. they've got the tiniest wine industry and yet they run and they all drink beer yeah yeah <laughs> anyway sorry carry on but that but <laughs> you know they run they run uh, Westset which is the um, wine spirit education trust. So anyway, uh, then you, you kind of write what you think about these wines and if it matches up with what the um, uh, assessor has written, yeah. then you will get marked on that. And I, I, in my blind, I had a one white and one red and I picked it as a Chardonnay, but also went pretty ballsy on it and I said that it was a Tasmanian Chardonnay and it was. <sighs> Yeah, I know. I really. I see a, the wry smile. I really had a crack, and then with the red, I was on. I thought I was on a bit of a roll, so <laughs> I thought I'll have a crack at the red, and I, I thought it was a Grenache, and then I changed my mind to, to believe it was a, a GSM, and then a uh, Grenache Shiraz Mavedra, and I. Uh, so I decided it was that. So I described it as that, and then I thought I'll take a punt, and I, I said that it would be from Avignon in France in the Southern Rhone, and I was right again. Wow! So I nailed them both. Did you have to pick the year? No. Thank God. No, but in the upper levels, once you get to like, you know, uh, Master of Wine and uh, yeah. Master Somme, like, the, you know, the movie Somme is based on that. You have to know the vintage, the vineyard, the maker, everything. Oh it's, my God. it's from the glass. It is, it's like. And how much would you drink? Uh, you don't drink any you, of it. You just, you just sip it and spit you just it. You just put it in your mouth a few times to spit it out. So you got both. Honestly, how confident were you when you made those? 
picks because they're pretty probably, ballsy picks, probably right? Probably too confident, I would say. <laughs> but that's the way I am. Like, you know, I always believe if, if you believe in something, then you should back that, whatever it is, particularly in business. You know, if you have a belief in something, yep. then you should back that. Because if you can't back your own beliefs, why would you back somebody else's? True. And why would somebody else back, back you? Yeah, correct. So if you don't believe in yourself, then the, you may as well just not do it. You may as well not try. Yeah. So, you know, you're better to, to try and fail than fail to try. So, yeah, I mean, if, if you've got, you don't do it, I'm not cavalier with those sorts of things, um, but I, um, I, I had a pretty good sense of what I was doing with that. Well, you would hope so. But, but let's not fool around, though. I was pretty bloody lucky. I fluked it. How, but how was, what's, what's, how do you study for that? Do you just, I mean, oh. you, you obviously can't just sit around getting hammered. That's not, because I just, I've done that a lot and oh, I don't no, know anything. And you're not qualified no, at all. I'm not if qualified. anything, you've, you've probably degenerated. I'm, do you think? Yeah, I think it's. I don't think it's helping you at all. <laughs> so, but how do you, how do you study for something like that? I mean, obviously there's the essays and the reading about yep. wine and all that sort of stuff. Yep. But what what else do you do other than just read? What else is there? I mean, I guess uh, you taste. Do you have to go to the regions? Do you have to do all that? Or? You should do all of it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, like, what's the timeline? Uh, it can be. It depends on. You can do do it over a period of time. For something like the plumber, I think the plumber takes two and a half years full time. Yeah, that's a long time. Yeah. It is, and it's very difficult. It's got a very, and like uh, level three, it's got a very, very high failure rate. Um, but the more you immerse yourself in it, I think if you've got an understanding of vines, because you have to know literally from the subsoil up. <sighs> so you have to know more than just what you're putting in the mouth. You have to know climate, aspect, uh, Acidity, topography, all, the whole thing. Everything, everything, everything. You have to know everything. You have to know about crazy little German towns and, and you know, little valleys in um, <laughs> South America and, you know, Chenin Blanc from South Africa. You must know all of it because you can be tested on any of it. So that must mean that you love it. Like, you to be able to spend that amount of time, not that it wouldn't be interesting, but it's, you know, we were talking about training just before, and we'll, we'll come to that in a minute, but before we did that, you get to a point where you go, you know what, I, I'm really done with training right now, I wouldn't mind having a break. Mm. With that sort of level of detail globally, right, that's, that's a huge volume of, of study for someone who claims not to be studious. Well, see, that's the thing, is that, like, I actually do, I'm, I'm not a, um, I wouldn't say I'm a natural-born student, and yet I continually upgrade qualifications every year. I always qualify myself in something every year, and I always take on something, usually a physical challenge each year as well, because yep. I believe, you know, if you're not growing forward and if you're not um, challenging yourself, usually under duress, you know, you should do things that make you properly uncomfortable, yep. because if you're not, you're not going to grow. But um, I got the wine qualifications because I knew I was going to be working in the wine industry, and I wanted the wine industry to see that, I had a true respect for what they do and that I, I really value what they produce and what they make. And I thought the best way I can do that is to get some qualifications to show that, that I'm fair to them. So I, I went about it and did it. And everything I do, I know that, you know, as a comedian, um, I can be a bit loose and we are, we are loose, but I, I'm also, I'm either, I'm very, very focused on, on anything I do. So if I, it's always 100. Everything's always at 100. Okay. If I choose to do something, it's 100%. Yeah. And I can flick between, I'm fortunate enough that I can flick between things quite rapidly. So, um, you know, I can go from, from brevity to levity quite fast. So with the, with the wine studies, I was like, I, I should do this because I want the respect of the wine industry so that I can then accomplish my goal, which is to run events there and to, and to bring people to wine. That's what I wanted. I was very clear on my Good vision luck. and my purpose. Do you think that the comedy background almost hindered you in the eyes of others in terms of taking you seriously because oh definitely we, we've we've had a lot of guests who've changed careers massively and yep. they nearly always go to something totally different and usually mm. what they've done actually doesn't help them at all it might actually help them but it doesn't help them in the view, in the eyes of others mm. well people i think just and i don't, i quite like it because i mean i cultivated it but um, i think people generally think that i'm an idiot <laughs> well that's why you're on here to show that you're an idiot. No, to show, <laughs> to show no, to people that you're not. It, Steve, to, to prove you know, it. To open up the inside, right? And to um, show what else is happening there. Yeah, look, I think that, I, I think a lot of people, and I, I, like I said, I cultivated, I created a kind of one dimensional comedy character, which was, uh, you know, me being a stupid child. And I've always, I love that. I still love doing that. When I perform, I love to be that person. But then, you know, when I, I, you can't apply that mentality and that personality to being the director of a company. No. You're responsible for other people. You've got partners who are invested. You've got to be responsible. And you know, to that point, you know, I go, have to go and do things that, again, I don't necessarily want to do. 
um, but go and study like, you know, AICD or something like that. Yep. Go and do that governance training because I've got a responsibility to these partners so that I can achieve our, our group goal, which is to, you know, to make these festivals, to make yep. these events, to build this company and to do all those things. I have to do those things as well. AICD so. directors, right? Isn't oh man, that, I hate isn't, that. Isn't that a punish? My oh, wife, my wife's about God. to start doing that, so you can ring her and tell her what she's got to look forward oh, to. I, I can't tell you like how little I enjoyed doing that. <laughs> it's just, it's the governance stuff was fine, but like once I started getting into the finances and and there was other parts of the course that I was just going, I really, I don't like this, but. You know, you just persevere because you have to. And one of the exams, two of the exams I did, I had to reset because yeah. I failed them. That's awful. That's it was awful. awful. For somebody who's, you know, um, was paralysed by the failure of repeating year 11 at a school where their mother was a teacher, um, it, it's tough. But it's, that's where, you know, I've got a, um, a type of resilience that allows me to just kind of and we'll, and we'll come back to resilience. Before we go on to that, I did want to touch on, you said you've obviously, you're a director of a company. You've got partners, you've got other mm -hmm. people. What, what does the operation look like now? You know, what, what, have, you, have you got people that backed you at the beginning as investors or are they people yeah. invested that work within the business or how, how is it all sort of structured? Um, structurally, it's actually pretty streamlined. I reckon uh, at the moment I would call this high speed, low drag. We have no um, private equity involved in our company at all. There's three partners and we all have equity. Cool. Um, so we have a, at the moment we have a GM and a festival director. So Jason and Nicholas is our GM and uh, Rowan Smith is our festival director and they mm -hmm. both have different skill sets um, but are just so awesome in, in part of you know, this kind of uh, trilogy of um, skills. Um, so the three of us work really, really well. We live in three different states. Perfect. But we communicate constantly you have to. and effectively. Um, so that's, that's a real trick to us. But then when we come together to do events or to, to do business, we are all on the same page, yep. on the same vision. Um, uh, you know, if having investors is something that we would entertain if and when we needed to. But um, there's no point seeking investment in something if you've got control of the financials no. yourself. Um, because otherwise you're just giving away equity. Absolutely. And allowing more voices to be involved in the conversation. So, um, yeah, and also too, if you're going to get uh, investment, then you want to have the right voices or lack of voice thereof in that conversation. If investment is something we talk a lot about. We of won't course. talk about it now, um, but it's, it's a horrible scenario. Sorry, investors, because we know lots of them too. But it's, it's, it's really difficult to get the right ones and it's really difficult to get the ones that aren't going to interfere too much or ones that do add value mm -hmm. or ones that just want to sit in the corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not an easy process, so don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> That's my advice. Anyway. And, but, but as we know, you know, growth is difficult and sometimes you get to a point where to take the next step in the growth chain, you have to look at outsourcing. Sometimes some you do. I mean, you can partner. I think, look, if you're building products in technology, you need investors, right? It's just yeah, so course. damn expensive. But I think when you're doing a business like yours, you might have to partner with someone at some... But you can yep. partner on events, right, rather than yep. giving away equity. So you've got yes. other ways of raising money and, and yes. sharing costs without having to give away equity. And if you can do that as a founder, that's, that's yep. awesome. So let's go back to resilience, right? So you've, you know, you've, you've come through an insane journey in terms of stand-up comedy. I mean, if you haven't got resilience, stand-up comedy is not a great choice. No, no. <laughs> Did you have any real shockers? Oh, yeah, heaps. What's like, the worst? There must be, I mean, don't um, say it's the first, because the first is always going to no, be a shocker. No, the first gig was great. You nailed I, the first gig. Yeah, I, actually, I had a good, gig, good first was gig. Was it your family? No, it was, <laughs> no, fortunately. <laughs> Uh, but my family were there. My brother and my father were there. All 285 of them. But I was, I was in a, yeah, I know. I need all my family to support me as a cheer squad. No, my first gig was good. Uh, but you have, you have bad gigs. And I think, you know. How does that feel? Because I imagine you're so expert. I mean, I've done a little bit of public speaking. I, it terrifies me, right? It's, one, it's okay once you get going, but it's, I just find the whole thing. But I you're have very to, comfortable in this space. Why I'm you, comfortable in this space. Why, not, why are you terrified of the public speaking? You know, it's the lead up to it. I'm actually comfortable once I'm started. Mm. But the hour before, I need to be on my own and I need to walk to the event. So I need to drive at least an hour away. This is, yeah. I do this. I did this in Adelaide. I was doing this thing in Adelaide and we were staying 10 minutes away. And I was like, well, this is a nightmare. So I ended up getting an Uber further away so that I could walk back. So I can literally just walk in without talking. Because right. that just works for me. But I just get so, so nervous. I just, and I have to just, I don't know. That's, that's my way of dealing with it. But I, I would imagine, you know, and I'm talking and there aren't people generally heckling me. But when you're a stand-up comedy, people are either laughing or they're not, right? There's no, has it gone well, has it gone, oh, he liked it, he didn't. It's, mm. it's evident. 
Mm. So you're so exposed. How does that feel? Well, uh, you know, you can have good gigs and bad gigs. It, you, it could be you. It could be the audience. It's always the audience. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's like a test for me. It's like a test and adjust thing. Like it's so, it's yeah, it constantly pivoting A/B on stage. Testing. You just if something's not working, don't force the issue. Yeah. Make light of it, and you know, literally get off the stage if you need to and get amongst people. Do whatever you have to do. But if it's not working, make the decision straight away that it's not working for whatever reason and try something else. And if that doesn't work, try something else. But if if a gig's not going well. Um, you know, the last time I had a bad gig was just a, a small stand-up gig in Sydney about f- probably, I think it was pre-COVID, it was about five years ago, six years ago, where I was like, I did a gig one week in one room and killed, I was like, wow, this is great. I hadn't done stand-up for a little while and I was like, oh, just keep the edge on the blade, this is unreal. Went back the next week and just died. <laughs> So, and it, same jokes, right? It was the same gear. And I was like, what is going on? And I, I rode my motorbike home and I was like thinking about... That probably about, wasn't a wise move. I know, right? <laughs> I was like, I just pence up, went home, had a couple of fingers of, of uh, scotch and had a bit of a think about it. And I went, calm down. Because I was like, you know, oh, this is ridiculous. I'm not doing this anymore. You know, why am I doing this? I'm at an age where I don't need to, to prove anything to anyone, all that sort of garbage. Yep. And then I was just like, Ugh. It's a bad gig. It's a statistic Just fact. It, You're going it. to have a bad gig, yeah. mate. And you haven't had one for a long time. And this is what it feels like. And if anything, it's a good reminder to teach yourself the resilience to get back. So I went back again the next week, did exactly the same material, but gave it more consideration before I went in mm-hmm. and did a great job. So you've got to realise sometimes, you know, if, if you're doing, you know, nine out of ten gigs are like that, stand-up's not for you. <laughs> But, you know, if you have a bad gig, it's like anything. You've just got to, you just got to roll with it and, and look I've for the next I've got an idea for you. I've got an idea for your event business. <sighs> Shoot. I'm going to share it on air so that it's, it's on record. Right? So it's in, case, in case it's a massive success. So, but if I don't do it, then it will look as though... Well, no, I'm going to edit, I'll edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> but my, <laughs> my thoughts is entrepreneurs need resilience, right? And, yes. I think, and I think you see that with... You tend to see it more so with older entrepreneurs just because they have more life and younger Mm. entrepreneurs either either have it or they haven't got it i think at the beginning right but they need to learn it right it's one of the hardest things and it's a miserable thing to learn Mm. it's horrible there's nothing enjoyable about it but you've got to learn it if you're going to be successful particularly over an extended period of time what if you ran events for young entrepreneurs where they had to do stand up so that that would teach them resilience so they could take that into the business world you could literally do this as an event you could call it i don't know founders of mirth yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, or something where they have to come and they can try it out and, you know, it's not going to work because most of them are going to be terrible at it because a lot of them are going to be tech founders that have never told a joke in their lives. It might help build resilience. Or, it, actually, as I say it, it sounds worse and worse as an idea. No, no. Do you know what, <laughs> Steve? In all honesty, I was, I, was, uh, doing like a, uh, I was doing a corporate speech to a very, very large multinational, right? I can't say who they were because under an NDA. But anyway, uh, no, literally so... Um, uh, they're a large multinational and they were discussing resilience and uh, motivation and, and I was like a key speaker and somebody said, oh, well, why don't, you know, what about doing stand-up, getting people to do stand-up because of the resilience mm. and exactly what you pointed out. And I said, but if, if you are not inclined to do it, it's not a good thing to do. Like it's actually not, it's you're brutal. not going to learn resilience from doing stand-up and humiliating, if anything, what it will do is it will push you back. Yeah, probably. Because you, if you if you are naturally inclined, like to to be um, a, be to be a performer, to be performative, yeah, yeah. then you're going to find that easier. But some people, that is literally so bad. That's like literally saying to me, "Hey, why don't you overcome your fear of sharks by putting yourself in the mouth of a shark?" <laughs> and I'd go, "I reckon." That that would not end well. That's the same with stand-up. We should definitely edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I, think, I think you've made a good point. But the answer is like stand-up is it's not just about public speaking either. Stand-up is about timing, nuance, um, a desire, to facial do expressions. It. Yeah, the there's whole so thing. much. It's, yeah. There's so much to, to go on, and you've got to want to do it. And what else you do? All right, let's let's move on because I don't want to sure. I don't want to dwell on that too much. But you what don't else? Want to talk to me for too long. No. I'd, I'd move on by no, now. No, no, no. Well, yeah, I haven't had anyone tell me to get off yet, so we've still got some time. But what else are you doing? I know that you're not just doing that business. You've no. got a lot of things on the go, and mm-hmm. I think a lot of and I want to touch on this because 
I have a lot of things on the go. A lot of other founders have a lot of things on the go. Mm -hmm. And yet everyone keeps telling me I need to have focus and I feel like I need to have focus, but then I want to have things on the go because it keeps it interesting. It's an interesting mm -hmm. battle. You yeah. have a lot of things on the go. How do you deal with that? And maybe tell us about some of them. Yeah, look, that's, I reckon that's probably the thing that I ponder the most is the, the multiple disciplines and the, the multiple things, the points of interest that I have, and then the time that I allocate to those things. So Grapes and Myth is by far and away the most important thing to me. Yep. Um, I love it um, and because it combines my passions and also too that is part of my vision and my purpose. And so I just am very, very, very locked onto that. But I also need to do lots of other different things. And I, I, what I love to do is bring ideas to life. Mm -hmm. So if I have an idea, I like to bring it to life. And I love nothing more than creating something that is unique and original. It's the definition of an entrepreneur. I just cannot not do it. So I, I can't have an idea and not explore it and, and see where it comes from. And as a result, I get unique offerings from result. So there's nothing like Grapes of Mirth in the world. Nope. Um, there is nothing like an idiot's guide to to wine in the world. I we'll need to do that. I really want to do that. It's amazing. We're touring it overseas next year. Um, Perfect. I'll come overseas. That sounds much yeah, it's more exciting. Great. <laughs> you could just go to Newcastle or you go to wherever you sit. But I'm uh, literally in the process now of writing the second version of that um, and an international version. Is that called Two Idiots? Yeah, Two Idiots and a, and a Chair. I was going to say something I think else. we should call them. <laughs> two, idiots, no. two Idiots, Two, two Chairs. chairs. Two chairs. No, back, back Two to Chairs, Two Idiots. We've gone, we've gone off track. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's unique. And uh, it's, it's um, a challenge that I've, I've kind of set out, an idea that I've set out with, and I've created a reality out of it. Yeah. So Grapes and Mirth, Idiot's Guide to Wine. I've got a podcast called Picture Discuss, which is just a short form podcast. It only goes for like 10 to 12 minutes, yep. but it's got a visual interface. It's the first one of its kind as well. What so, do you mean? So when you, when you watch the podcast, it's three comedians and we sit around and we talk about a picture. That's why it's just called Picture Discuss. But on the face card of the podcast, as opposed to having the same title each time, it changes and you, and you can get it in the show notes and you can get it on, uh, you can see it on Instagram as well. You can see the, the, the picture that we're talking about. So it's visually interactive. So it's called, say it again, Picture, picture Discuss. I'm going to look that up. I so like that's, the sound of that. So that's unique as well. So I like doing things that haven't been done before. I'm really, really driven by... Two, two motivators for me are things that have never been done before or things that people think I can't do, which is why I did SAS Australia. I did that because I think partly because I, I well, mostly because I wanted to know that I could do it because I believed I could, but also too because I, I think the majority of people until that point thought that I wouldn't have been Did capable. you enjoy it? I didn't love doing the thing, <laughs> but I, I, loved, I loved completing it successfully and yeah. I loved showing that... Uh, there's more than that one dimension. And you've just done a marathon as well, right? Yeah, I did a marathon yeah. a few, a couple, about two months ago. Yeah, because I've been seeing you running around. Yeah. So that's a physical challenge for the year. Done. Yeah. With, it's October. Yeah. So it's like you know, you've only got to start another one so soon. I know. I know. I'm already thinking about what I'm going to do next year. I, just, I don't know. I, I just think it's... Try it's, wing foiling. I saw that on Instagram. I was like, oh, I would love to do you that. You can do it in Rose Bay. Oh, oh, really? Yeah, I've been doing it in Rose Bay. You can come, come on a few lessons with me. I've been trying to do it. It's really, really hard. But the, yeah, the question is, how do you do it without looking like a wanker? How's so the, they, uh, the first lesson, they just have you on the board and they tow you to get used to the board. Then you learn to fly the kite the, and then you just put it together. It's, yeah, that's but, how he described it to me on the but, first lesson. But when does, when does the point stop where you still, like you don't look like a tool So anymore? I've had 10 hours. And I think I'm closer. <laughs> I'm teasing you. The answer is it never ends because if you're doing that, if you're doing wind foiling, it's you've got so too hard. much money and too much time on your hands. It's so both. hard. It's so hard. It's it really is. You should try. I think you do. It's, it's, you know what it is? You talk about, I like putting things that make me uncomfortable and then completely, I have terrible balance, which is one of the reasons I want to try and do it. I have really bad natural balance, even on like land. So this is just ridiculous. But... It's so complicated. There's so much going on. One, it makes me completely switch off from all my companies because I can't possibly think about anything else, and that's great. But two, it really activates your brain in ways you never dreamt of because you're mm. trying to balance, you're trying to hold this, you're trying to work out where the wind is, you're trying to move your feet. It's mental how much is going on. Yeah. I think you should try it out. Well, it's good for your brain because anything that, yeah, that it's really good for your brain. makes you, you know, consolidate all of your attention on one thing, it's, that's what meditation is. It's a form yep. of meditation. It allows you to shut down all the other tabs. Because you, like me, have probably have too many tabs open, too Way many interests, too many, interest, many desires to do too many things. But the, the thing is, I, do, I have lots of interests, 
but I fulfill them all. Like it doesn't. If I say I'm going to do something, it gets done. Yeah. I never. I and never that's say, awesome. I never say I'm going to do something and then it doesn't get done. I, I think. I think you'd like this. It's much better than swimming. Swimming, all you do is think about everything because there's nothing else to do. Oh, stare at that line. Or if you're in the ocean, you just worry about getting. I'm just worrying about sharks. Well, you see anything move. I went for a swim and I saw a shark once and I was like, I don't want to say that again. That's Were you like, in the aquarium at the zoo again? Yeah, it was a wobby gong. It was <laughs> no, legitimately, it was a wobby gong and I thought I'm dead. It was a wobby gong and I went, oh, come on, seriously. That's the Labrador of the shark world. Yeah, it's not, it's not scary. No, it's not. But maybe <laughs> um, I'll, give, I'll give the foiling a go. What's your next event? Uh, I've got Comedy in the Vines, which is our biggest ever event. It's uh, huge. It's a, uh, Comedy in the Vines is, is in uh, Ngambi um, at Hide and Seek Winery in Ngambi in Victoria. Hide it's and a, Seek Winery? I've a, never heard of that. It's near where like Tabilk is and Mitchelton and uh, Fowles is up there as well. So we're working with a group of the wineries there and we bring them all onto one site. And it's just two days of, of comedy and wine and cooking demonstrations and master classes and wine master classes and it's a multi multi discipline festival and sell it's hot. That's uh, I, I did the Lovedale long lunch years ago before I had children and had time and could do things like that. And I used to love that because it was around all the wines and you moved yep. around. Yep. But that was just the wines really and a few yep. food stalls and the odd band. Yep. This is obviously, so it's comedy, it's yep. food demonstrations. Big stages, like it's, massive it's stages. It's one venue, right? DJs, it's like out on lawns. How long, how many, drugs. is it one day, two days? What is it? It goes for two days. It's on the 11th and the 12th of November. And oh, good. It's great. You can just go to comedyinthevines.com if you want to have a look at it. But it's, it's pr like, as far as like a lineup goes, it's, I think it's the, the biggest uh, comedy lineup uh, regional Australia has ever seen. Wow. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty epic, and I'm involved as well. So I mean, you know, if you're a fan, oh, it's not just you're not just promoting, you're not just the face. Yeah, no, I'm there on the day. So if you want to, you know, have something signed, I'll be there. If you want a <laughs> selfie, well, there's a I'll whole bunch of people outside here waiting to get things yeah, signed. Oh no, no, there's, there's no, no one. one. There's, there's no, no one. one. There's, no, there's they've no one. left for the day. So oh, I think I'm, they had a big event last night. That's why there's no one here. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I thought it was my presence, but there you go. So. Um, <laughs> What's next? You know, you've got, obviously you're going to keep pushing on with the uh, Grapes of Myrrh. Yes. You're going to keep doing your media stuff here and there, I guess. Yep, yep. Um, you got any other TV shows planned? Uh, no TV. I'm uh, a celebrity, get me out of here. No. Don't do that. No. I've done, I think once, you do, once you've done SAS Australia and you've completed it successfully, it's very difficult to entertain something that you might fail at. Because you just go, why, do, why be successful in the hardest thing? and then go and fail in something that is not. Oh, you're married, Love Island's out. Um, well, I mean, there's always an option, isn't there? Like, I always... shouldn't discount it Well, entirely. part of it's trying, what's the one where they try and split you up? You could do that one, that sounds like a healthy thing to do. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> I'll bring my wife and ask what she thinks about that. I think it's gonna be a hard no. No, I don't think it's a good idea. But well, yeah, what is planned? What's next for you? Um, uh, I will tour uh, an Idiot's Guide to Wine overseas next year and see how that goes. I'm very interested to take it to the UK and then to America. I think it will go well yeah. in the UK. I think your, your style of comedy is very in line with the UK comedy. Is it? I think so. That's a good thing to say. Um, yeah, the geezers like me. Yeah, well, I've been here 25 years now, but I've still got a, still got a finger on the, on the yeah. pulse. Yeah, well, you're, and, and you, you think I'm great. So I think you're amazing. Nailed it. Um, the US? Yeah. yeah, I'd love to go to the That'd US. That'd be interesting to see how it go down in each state. I reckon there's a couple... I mean, you'd only have to look at, you know, some... Be selective. Yeah. You'd be selective there. Maybe just stay to the New, York, New York and LA and then just get the hell out of there. Yeah, the ones, the ones where they appreciate wine is probably the best ones. The ones where they appreciate mm. shooting targets, maybe less so. Yeah, we won't talk about those. I think you should take it to the Caribbean. Really? Yeah. I'd love to take it to the Caribbean. It's very English You've still. got contacts there. I'll go there. Well, yeah. I mean, they're all independent islands now. Yeah, great. It'd be awesome. I think it'd yeah. be awesome. I'll do an island tour. Yeah, go Tropo. Good. Fantastic. That's a great idea. Lock it in. <laughs> So yeah, that's to answer your question, more more of the same, but just like more of it. And I've got a couple of a couple of little secret projects that I can't talk about now, but always do. Well, and always again, always unique, never been done before. I, I, I think you're to... you're in our ninety somewhere between ninety and hundred shows, right? Which is great news because when we hit hundred shows, we're gonna have a party and invite all the first hundred guests. So you're gonna you're gonna sneak into that. But it also means we're probably gonna we're thinking about whether we invite those hundred guests back again. For second one. So you may get another invite to talk about oh, the secret mate, project. I've seen most of the episodes that you've recorded. I'd be very surprised if I didn't get asked back. I even. thought you were going to say if, that, if no. any of them came back. No, I mean, I, I just, <laughs> I just, I, I'll be, I know that you have had a couple of people come back. Um, we have had a couple. Uh, but I would be very surprised if I wasn't asked to return, just given how much I offer. Yeah. <laughs> 
think that's fair. Mate, thank See you. how switched? Back to being a joke. Yeah, I you. thought you were going to ask me something then. Mate, <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. It's Thanks been awesome to have, have you on. And I th I, honestly, the, with all the jokes aside, I think there's a lot of lessons in there that are different to a lot of the people we've often had on. Like, for one thing, you're not a tech founder, you wouldn't know how to write a line of code. That's great. Everyone who doesn't know has been waiting for me to get someone who doesn't know how to write a line of code. So we've got a whole new you said, audience. You said code. You said the word yes, code. Yes, I said that. Said that. Oh, because yeah. I, yeah, I know the show business version of something that sounds similar Mode? to that. No, it's, it's like code, but it's not code. But anyway, <laughs> that was a long time ago. Let's move out of this. Yeah, let's, let's move, move out of this. It's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Guys, thanks for watching. Um, don't forget to subscribe, and we'll see you next week.